सहनावतु सहनाव भुनक्तु सहवीर्यम करबावहि तेजस्वी नावधी तमस्तु माविद्विशावहि ओम शांति 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 <coughs> Sahiram everyone. We have been studying the 10th Anuvaka of uh, Namakam, Pasam Chamakam, Sri Rudram. Uh, last week we had uh, looked at half of it. Today we will continue. So, as mentioned uh, last week, the thing 10th Chamakam is to, uh, talks about. The entire journey of our life in the path of spirituality. Um, we start with Garbhas Chami, you know, from the womb, Vatsa, we become a child, and you know, various process of purification so that our life can be offered as sacrifice, as a part of as a yajna. So, in this yajna, we are still continuing in the last. Uh, last two mantras which we looked at were pranaschame apanaschame so we have come to the five life forces in us prana is the life force which makes us alive the life force which comes from outside which we breathe in which is prana that's that's that remains in our body as life force and apana is the that which processes everything which comes from outside and it that's the one which separates what is right from wrong what has to be discarded and what has to be absorbed uh, it's part of digestion you know uh, apana is necessary for digestion to absorb and internalize everything and reject what should be rejected that is the job of apana uh, which we looked at so now we will continue from where we left off I will read the next mantra. Vyanas chame kalpata. Vyanaha yajna yajnyena kalpata. Vyanaha yajnyena kalpata. It's okay, so I think we are okay. Vyana, actually, generally you will say Vyano Yajnana Kalpata, but I have already split it, so I will leave it as is. Usually you would say Vyano Yajnana Kalpata, but Vyano is actually Vyanaha. Vyanaha becomes Vyano because of Sandhi. I will just fix it so that there's no confusion next time uh, when you encounter that mantra Vyano Yajnana Kalpata. Vyano yajnena kalpata. Vyano yajnena kalpata. So when split, it's vyanaha yajnena kalpata. Vyanaha is the vyana life force. Or vyana vayu also people say. But that's vyana is that which distributes, okay, that which pervades. So that force is present in our body as well as in the entire world. In the entire world, everything spreads. Um, in our body, the, what is absorbed through the process of digestion gets distributed to every cell in the body. That distribution, it's vyana. 
okay vyapaka mean that which is present everywhere it spreads forth and infuses everything with energy that ability of prana is vyana so that is present in us so we are praying that 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 spreading let it become beneficial yagnena that is yagnena means through yagna or by yagna yagnena is the third vibhakti or third case third noun form of the word yagna okay yagnena so through yagna kalpatam kalpatam means let it be perfect let it become beneficial let it be propitious however you want to look at it so even the vyana vayu in us let it spread and through that spreadness spreading let it become beneficial so that it can be offered as yajna uh, so through the yajna only that also becomes perfected purified and beneficial we'll go to the next mantra chakshur yajnena kalpatam chakshur yajnena kalpatam chakshur yajnena kalpatam actually when you chant the mantra this kalpatag is the way it's pronounced okay that um anuswara becomes ug because of sandhi okay uh, so but when you the sandhi is split that we get the word kalpatam in its original form again chakshur is also because of sandhi it is chakshuhu okay in terms of pronunciation it should be reasonably simple this ukshu is actually the cerebral sh so the tongue should ideally be bent and pointed upwards chakshu okay chakshu yajnena kalpata chakshuhu yajnena kalpata when the chakshu yajnena is split the meaning of this mantra is chakshu means that which you see but chakshu is anything which we experience in this world is also chakshu chakshu can be speech also okay uh, so anything which we experience in this physical world we we see or experience that is chakshu but generally it is related to eyes because eyes become one of the primary ways which we take in the world the knowledge okay so chakshu yagna na kalpatam let our eyes be beneficial through yagna that means we should offer our eyes as sacrifice and through that the eyes becomes kalpata may this eye become beneficial through the process of yajna through offering so you know we can ask you know what is this offering of the eyes uh, as in the yajna means the eyes should be used only to see what is positive what is divine it should at no point be used for something else so i always say is once you offer it to the fire you should not be using it for anything else uh, you should only see what is divine okay see what is good uh, we should not be indulging in seeing anything which is bad that is the idea until then we have not really sacrificed to offer our eyes our sight our vision into the fire as an offering to the lord chakshu yajna so but by offering it to the yajna of the lord that will become purified that will become perfect that will become beneficial that's the meaning of chakshu yajna na kalpata we'll go to the next mantra shrotram yajna na kalpata shrotram yajna na kalpata shrotram yajna na kalpata um it should be pronunciation wise rather simple uh, let's look at the meaning shrotram shrotram means ears that which through which we listen shrotram yajna kalpa let our ear be beneficial through yajna 
so here also should be offered to the Lord and through that process of offering to the Lord that is yajna it will become beneficial it will become perfect it will become purified Kalpatam is the best which we can think of may the year also be beneficial so which basically means we have to listen to what is good Shravanam is one of the nine parts of devotion Shravanam is the first listening to all that is divine the stories of the Lord uh, so our year we should not be listening to anything and sundry we should be very very discriminative in what we hear that is the process of offering our ears to the lord that means oh, you, we only listen to the glory of the lord as much as possible it's it's a process so, see the mantras don't mean you know just chanting means it happens it, we have to practice also mantras uh, when we chant the chanting is only to remind us what we should do. Um, that's the process of the mantra. So not only along with chanting, we have to practice the mantra. I means we should practice what is the essence of that mantra. That's what Swami has said. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, I, I thought I will get some excerpts from that, but, uh, but there will become too much because I have already excerpted quite a bit of Swami's discourse today so I did not but you know whatever we are going to cover will cover some of it okay so that's why I have I am explaining what Swami generally would has said um, so we will go to the next mantra Mano Yajnena Kalpata Mano Yajnena Kalpata Mano Yajnena Kalpata. In terms of pronunciation, this mantra is very, very simple. So it should be okay for you all. The Sandhi, uh, Mano is because of Sandhi, but the, the, once it's broken, it's Manaha, okay, Manas, whichever way you want to put it. So Manaha Yajnena Kalpata. Manaha Yajnena Kalpata. So let the mind become purified, become perfect through yajna. Manaha, mind, yajna, through yajna, kalpata, may it become perfect. May it become fit to be offered. May it become beneficial. All those meanings are embedded in the word kalpata. Okay. So we are praying to the Lord that you know, let our mind be become pure by this process of offering. So that means we have to offer the mind also to the Lord. That means we only think of the Lord all times. The mind should be always engrossed in the thought of God. Thought, uh, anything divine, anything, everything auspicious. Through that process, the mind will become purified, will become beneficial. That is what this mantra stands for, Mano Yajnena Kalpata. We'll go to the next mantra. Vag Yajnena Kalpata. I'm sorry, made a mistake. Those who are printed, please correct. Otherwise, I will be saving the corrected version after the class. Vag Yajnena Kalpata. Vag Yajnena Kalpata. <clears throat> so it should be rather simple to pronounce Vag Yajnena Kalpata. Vag Yajnena Kalpata. When the Sandhi is split, it's a Vak. Vak Yajnena Kalpata. Vak comes from the root Vach, which is to speak. In Tamil also, I think many of you are Tamil. So Vak comes from the word Vak in Sanskrit. Vak itself comes from the word Vach, which is to speak. So it's speech. So may our speech 
become beneficial through yajna. Let our speech become beneficial through yajna, that is offering to the Lord. Um, which is again, Namasmarana, or, you know, Sankirtanam, sing the songs of the Lord, uh, chanting some mantras, um, you know, so the walk speech should be always used in everything divine. Think of the speak of the Lord, chant the name of the Lord, sing the name of the Lord. All that is Vag Yajna. Vag Yajna means how we use speech as as a prayer, as an offering to the Lord. So once we offer it to the Lord, then the tongue should not talk about anything else. That is ideally ultimate offering of the work. So we are asking the Lord to help us offer our speech in the fire as an offering to the Lord. Through that, our speech itself will become purified, will become beneficial, it will become perfect. Kalpata. I will go to the next mantra. Atma Yajnena Kalpata. Atma Yajnena Kalpata. Atma Yajnena Kalpata. It should be rather too simple for you all to chant. So, uh, pronunciation wise, there's nothing for me to say. You look at the meaning. Atma. I think all of us have some understanding of what the Atma is. Um, the most commentators have struggled with this. I would say they would say Atma means Ahankaram, your sense of that your small self that should be offered through Yajna so that that will become beneficial. So ultimately, we should understand that yajna is when anything is put in the fire it gets purified so which basically this mantra say the mind should be purified in the fire speech should be purified in the fire the atman also should be purified in the fire so the question may be atma is anyway pure that's what we're saying yes atma is pure but as jivatmas as individualized soul so whatever you want to call the ourselves individualized atman we have the taints of various vasanas which stick to this atma and the entire sadhana is to purify that so that we attain our original self all sadhana is for that uh, we will go into reading a few discourse excerpts of swami and we will discuss embodiment of love. Deepa Kant, a student who spoke earlier before Swami, asked the question, who are the parents of Brahma, Vishnu and Maheshwara? No one knows the answer to this question. Neither the Upanishads nor the various other scriptures throw any light on the subject. Brahma, Vishnu and Maheshwara have no physical form. However, they are Gunaswarupa, that is, they represent specific qualities and attributes. Their presence within the body along with the latent Gunas and the intrinsic tendencies of the individual motivates all feelings, thoughts, speech, and actions. Man today does not even understand the correct meaning of a human being. How then can he comprehend that he is divine in origin? Your first task should be to understand that Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwara are immanent in you. Isha Vasyam Idam Jagat. God pervades the entire universe 
and dwells in all beings. He is your indweller. He is the Atma. Shruti or the sacred texts have a special name for this Atma that exists in all. It is Hridaya. Hridaya refers to the spiritual heart. The Atma or the Hridaya is also known as Ishvara. The mind is born of the Atma and is the embodiment of Vishnu. Vedas say Vishwam Vishnumayam Jagat. Vishnu pervades the whole universe. The mind does likewise. Mano Moolam Idam Jagat. Since the mind also pervades the whole universe, it is identified with Vishnu. Thus, Ishvara and Vishnu are present in all individuals. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam. Ishvara dwells in all beings. The Vishnu principle is born of the Ishvara principle. Next we have Brahma. Traditionally, Brahma is pictured as being seated in a lotus that emerges from the navel of Vishnu. In the individual, Brahma is associated with speech. He is Vak Swarupa. That is, he manifests as the spoken word. This is because the mind is the origin of word. The scriptures describe God as follows. Shabda Brahmamayi, Characharamayi, Jyotirmayi, Vangmayi, Nityanandamayi, Paratparamayi, Mayamayi, Shrimayi. God Almighty is the primordial sound, the immovable as well as the movable. The divine, sorry, sorry. the divine light, the word, eternal bliss, the supreme, the illusion and ultimate wealth. This is a comprehensive description of God. The divinity manifests in the individual as three principles. The principles of the Atma, the principle of the mind, the principle of the word. Maheshwara, Vishnu and Brahma are associated with these three interrelated principles. Brahma, Vishnu, Ishwara have no specific form but manifest in the individual as the three principles mentioned. Give expressions to the divine principles through pure feelings, thoughts and words. What is the form of the Atma? What is the form of Ishwara? Atma is pure or absolute consciousness and consciousness does not have any form. In the individual, absolute consciousness functions as the conscience. It is a resident, its residence is the heart. From the Atma is born the mind, which has cognitive power, it is the mind that enables us to cognize both the outside world as well as the world within. And mind in turn is the fountainhead of word and speech. On occasion, Swami reminds you that you are not one but three. You are not the one who you think you are. You are not the one others think you are. You are the one you really are. This basically implies that you are all three principles all rolled into one. You are the composite of the heart, mind and body. And Ishvara, Vishnu and Brahma provide the subtle basis for these three aspects of yourself. Uh, there are many other discourses which I could have put where Swami is going into, you know, how we purify the heart, how do we purify the mind, how do we purify the speech. So this, this 
description is embedded in the three mantras which we looked at mano yajna na kalpatam vak yajna na kalpatam atma yajna na kalpatam so these are three concepts in us they embody the divine principles of Ish shiva vishnu and brahma and these three mantras basically talk about that that trinity which is within us which should be offered into the fire and through that process it has to be purified this is swami uses the word three karan shuddhi also thought word and speech should be uh, thought word and deed should be purified so all this comes from that so this offering is nothing but this mantra signify that so that is the reason which uh, i thought i will highlight one more we will take up atma nivedanam or atparpanam surrender of the self emperor bali the grandson of prahlada was an example of a devotee who completely surrendered to the lord offered everything he possessed to the lord and thereby sanctified his life he was totally dedicated in his devotion to the lord he was prepared to offer his head to the lord and go down to the nether world no sacrifice was too great for him to win the lord's grace when his guru sukracharya advised him to go back on the gift he had promised to vamana bali rejected that advice declaring that his life his body and all that he had belonged to the lord this is a discourse from 1986 um, so we have you know we this 10th anuvaka we chanted all the uh, mantras and the last one is atma yajnana kalpata there's one more coming but atma yajnana kalpata means we offer our entire self in the fire so even in the path of nine paths of devotion it starts with shravanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam nam vandanam thus you know it, it goes to dasyam sakyam atma nivedana which is the ninth one where one offers everything to the lord okay so that is ultimate purnahuti is offering our entire self to the lord and through that process our entire life is perfected the goal of life purpose of life is also achieved we'll go to the last mantra of the 10th anuvaka yajnyo yajnena kalpata yajnyo yajnena kalpata yajnyo yajnena kalpata so yajnyo yajnena yajnyo is yajna because of sandhi it becomes yajnyo yajnyo yajna yajnena kalpata that means may the yajna be beneficial through yajna may this yajna be beneficial be become perfect may become fit through the process of yajna is the mantra says so the question may be asked why is yajna also through yajna so how do we offer yajna to the lord because the yajna is the process which has helped us all this time now even that also is offered to the lord so the thing is we recognize that everything belongs to the lord even the process of yajna also belongs to the lord that also has to be given up this is like you know we use a ladder to climb up somewhere and once you climb up the ladder is not needed so you just offer it you take a boat to cross the stream okay the boat takes you to the other side once you go to the other side that boat is also given up that's the final sacrifice detachment so one who has attained offered the atman for that person the yajna as a concept also doesn't exist that is also given back to the lord the yajna goes back to yajna itself we don't retain anything which we say is good so swami says even if you do seva the thought that we have done seva also should be given up 
we should not be spoken. That means we are with the other ways we are carrying that. And whether we do sadhana, that 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 we did sadhana also should be offered to the Lord. So that is the ultimate sacrifice which uh, Jivatma makes to f attain that fullness, perfect merger with the Lord. Okay, so that is uh, described in this mantra nicely. I have an excerpt. I think it is 9.30 only. But anyway, we'll read uh, this uh, section and then we'll come back. One uh, excerpt from Swami's discourse. How amazing is this? A person can get sacrifices galore performed through scholars versed in Vedic rituals, ritual law, and himself perform them. A person can praise the holiness of diverse shrines and spots to inspire others to journey there to and himself journey thither. A person can teach the eight vidyas to many and make them experts and himself master them all. But few are there who succeed in mastering their bodies, senses and wayward minds and turn inward to gain the perpetual and unchanging equanimity. Life is most precious. The breath, prana, which sustains it, is even more precious. Nevertheless, it becomes often necessary to give up this precious prana while attempting to realize some goals. Human nature is such that man is never content with a single achievement. He feels there's always room at the top. This urges him on and on towards higher and higher goals. He wins many victories and craves for more. He never attains satiety. To be ever discontented, that state alone gives him contentment. Man embarks upon an undertaking with a purpose, goal, or an end in view. But the endeavor is sublimated into a yajna, sacrificial rite, which can draw down the grace of God. Only if the purpose, the goal, or end is glorification of law, God, regardless of other considerations. Yajno vai Vishnu says the Veda, Vedas. God is the yajna, for he is the goal. His grace is the reward. His creation is used to propitiate him. The performer is he, the receiver is he. When the ego of the sacrificer does not claim a place, the yajna is rendered divine. Aham hi, aham hi, sarva yajnanam. In all yajnas, I am the doer, the donor, the consumer, the acceptor. This is the reason the chief priest in a yajna, such as the Veda Purusha yajna, we are inaugurating now, is named Brahma. The priest nominated as Brahma has to guide the rest of the rituals, ritualists. The priest nominated as Brahma, has to guide the rest of the ritualists. He must have his wife by his side, or else his credentials are inadequate. The wife represents faith, Shraddha. Without faith, praise is hollow. Adoration is artificial. Sacrifice is a barren exercise. Yes, sister. Sister, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, brother. Okay. Um, the uh, the wife represents faith, Shraddha, without faith, right? 
how that is uh, like uh, you know all the wives you have think uh, that uh, i think um who has to have faith if the the priest or the the wife also has to have uh, faith this is something you know because uh, uh, swami is bringing two people in right so they won't be in the same state of mind so i'm trying to understand where this is coming from right okay sister thank you i think sometime back in i think uh, one of the early anvakas we looked at what's called patni vataschami i don't know whether you all know one who is who has path Pa, you know, patni, patni, what has changed? We looked at. I think at that point I had made a, made a remark that you know, for any function you need to have the wife present, otherwise you can't do it. So that is what the shastra self described. So in the physical sense, uh, a couple have to sit and do the yagna. That's why I said all yagnas are meant for only for householders. When you go into Vanaprastha or sannyasa, yagnas are not performed. So, for any physical ritual which we undertake, the wife has to be present. So, that is the one aspect at the uh, gross level. At the subtle level, it means we, along with our, you know, whatever we intend to do, there should be shraddha. So, in anything which we take undertake. For example, if we want to do some activity, for the activity inside us, there should be that this is the wish to do, and we are doing it, but that has to be always accompanied by shraddha. So now the question is, you asked is whether the the, the priest who is performing should have shraddha, or whether the wife should have shraddha. So the reality is when. Externally looked at, two people are there. Husband has a certain role to play. The wife has a role to play. So the wife's role is to make sure that the husband does the proper thing. The person, as wife who sits, is to make sure and support and make sure the husband is focused on the activity because they are the best people to make a husband do what they do. Because others may not be as successful as a wife. You know, because they are supposed to know the person, they are supposed to know how to guide them. So their role in any spiritual sadhana is to guide the person to do what is right. Okay, so that is shraddha. No distractions are allowed. So in the physical sense, wife has a certain role to play. But at mental level, both of them have to have shraddha in what they are doing. They should be very focused. And without failure, they should be doing what they have to do. So each person, so all of us actually are, have two, both. We have Shiva and Parvati in us, Shiva and Shakti. For which, so both, both energies are present in every human being. Okay. So the external two actually symbolize what is inside each of us. And inside each of us applies to everyone. Whether it's the priest or the wife or every other ritualist. I hope uh, that answers your question. And nowadays it's hard to find. That's why I just ask. Okay. That's because sister, sister, the yeah. thing is, we we can't. We have to first find shraddha in us. Okay. Once we have shraddha in us, shraddha will accompany all the people with shraddha will come to us. Okay. That so is because that is not in our hands. Work, that is work. in the hands of God. So the thing is, we are if we are searching and we are not finding means, then there is something wrong in us okay. that we are not finding it. Very very simple. Okay, that's okay. Yes. I think we were studying Gita Vahini. In Gita Vahini, Swami is saying exact same thing. He is saying, uh, Krishna has given a promise. I will look after everything. Anyatasha, you know, one who ananyachin, who don't have, they don't think about anything else. They are looked after by yoga kshemam vaham yaham. Okay. Ananyas chinta yanto maam yajana paryupasate tesham nityabhyuktanam yoga kshemam vaham yaham. So he says, God has given the promise, I will look after everything of you. 
people say what god is not looking after they find fault with the lord he says no if you don't find then you should go back and check whether you have done your part which is thinking of the lord at all times so the thing is in life if we don't get anything the situation is not right people are not there to help us the problem swami says it's in you because if you are fix yourself i will provide everything oh that answers the question thank you so much <laughs> see it is not coincidence that we are studying this and we are studying that in parallel because swami makes sure that we learn this and that exactly this is what we have been discussing for the past couple of weeks they are also okay yes brother tasan yes sir i am brother so uh, um in the ashwamedha jatna lord rama wants to have his wife and wife was in the jankar and he made the statue and kept it beside him to do the jatna and one more thing you have, when we were studying you told when the both are there it's like a vaikundam that place is going to be vaikundam so how can you relate to this one then both i think i have already tried to answer this question brother okay because the thing is if we do not find this appropriate circumstances around us that means internally we have to work harder uh, so the thing is when we internally work harder we will find vaikuntham inside as well as outside uh, i think that is the answer so if we do not have vaikuntham outside let us find the vaikuntham inside and that will result in vaikuntham outside also both are related Uh, it's a, so it's a rama if it, if he did it he did it to symbolize see rama was still married to sita even though she was sent to the forest so rama was that so in his mind sita was with him but to externally symbolize to the world a, a golden statue of sita was kept next to him which actually is satisfied by the see if somebody is spending so much to make a woman of gold you know how much money you need so a person who you know people will say i can give a couple of necklaces and get another wife and put her next to me rama could have easily done but he just wanted to show that in your mind you if you consider someone as wife and they are next to you to support then that's it so the that's what rama see if external rituals are symbolic of what should happen within us so that's the only role of external rituals but external rituals are needed to remind ourselves of what is inside so rama externally showed us what should be within us he rama had shraddha he had also the thought that she is the wife both he demonstrated through that process of you know making a statue and then doing ashwamedha yagna only when we do something like that the mind can be brought under control we already looked at ashwamedha swami says ashwam is that which moves which symbolizes mind which is always fickle so controlling that wherever even if it roams everywhere nothing in the world should be able to grab it if it anything grabs you need to fight that distraction so the mind should freely roam without falling a victim or slave to anything in this world that is ashwamedha yagna that is possible for someone who has shraddha and who is determined and he offers everything to god that is ashwamedha yagna rama basically did it to demonstrate all these principles to us so the vaikuntham will happen we will attain vaikuntham and internally we have shraddha bhakti and we do sadhana and offer everything to the lord through that process we will attain vaikuntham inside as well as outside that's what my understanding i hope uh, i makes some sense brother sir thank you sir ram brother we we'll go to continue the excerpt really speaking the heart is the ceremonial altar the body is the fireplace the hair is the holy grass dharva 
Wishes are the fuel sticks with which the fire is fed. Desire is the ghee that is poured into the fire to make it burst into flame. Anger is the sacrificial animal. Fire is the tapas we accomplish. People sometimes interpret tapas as ascetic practices like standing on one leg or on the head. No, tapas is not physical contortion. It is the complete and correct coordination of thought, word and deed. When this is achieved, the splendor of the fire will manifest. Talking of thought, word and deed in the context of the Veda Purusha Yajna, I have to tell you that Rig Veda is Vag speech taken form. Sama Veda contains hymns that are sung. It is Shrotra hearing which has taken form. Whenever the speech is saturated with truth and compassion, or inspired by service to others, it becomes Rig Veda. Good deeds are Yajur Veda. Divine discourse from 1981. So Swami has given a complete, at least supreme meaning for the Yajna. So when we pour the ghee, we should know what we are pouring. When we put the sticks in the fire, we need to know what it is. When we light the fire, you should know what that fire is. And what is this darba grass? When they go, we should see. So every cell in our body, everything should be offered. In the ceremonial altar, we looked at in the ceremonial altar also. There were some mantras which we looked at in the past. You know, we had. You know, is it uh, is it the higher pedestal? It's a lower pedestal. You know, everything was mentioned. So basically, our body is the place where the fire yajna is taking place. Okay, the body is the fireplace, Swami says. There is an altar of different kinds. Heart is a ceremonial altar. So Swami wants us to change our body into a temple or a yaga shala. What we do with this, our entire body, mind and thought, the body, mind and heart should all be yajna. And all should be offered to the Lord. And Swami gives that as the ultimate yajna we are doing and this chamakam basically tells from you know from birth we have to reach that place so the tenth anavaka in my view just in a crux tells what is yajna why we are born in the womb of a mother and where should we go the place where we reach is the fireplace where we offer everything to the lord and as swami says you know Everything, fire is the tapas we have to accomplish. From the darkness which is in the womb, the womb which we are in darkness, tamas. From that we come out and become tapas. Um, so that's the uh, essence and uh, Swami has very, very nicely explained. So this 10th and Vaka is actually all this. So it is only in this context I had given certain meanings which are not found in the other uh, commentaries. Uh, so, so I thought I will just that summarize that. We have one more excerpt. I will read that as well. Remember that with every step you are nearing God. And God too takes 10 steps towards you when you take one step towards him. There is no stopping place in the pilgrimage. It is one continuous journey through day and night, through valley and desert, through tears and smiles, through death and birth, through tomb and womb. When the road ends, the goal is gained. The pilgrim finds that he has traveled only from himself to himself that the way was long and lonesome, but the God that led him unto it was all the while in him, around him, with him, and beside him. He himself was always divine. His yearning to merge in God was but the sea calling to the ocean. Man loves because he is love. He craves for melody and harmony because he is melody and harmony. He seeks joy for his joy. He thirsts for God 
for he is composed of God and he cannot exist without him. This is a discourse Swami given way back in 1968. So, you know, it basically talks about two, womb to tomb, you know, from birth to death. Where are we going? What are we achieving? What is the goal? So from Garbha, from the, you know, we are taking birth to this final offering of offering our entire Atman to the Yajna. That's the purpose of life. That's nicely described in this 10th Anuvaka. And 11th Anuvaka is completely different. So I am not starting the 11th Anuvaka today. Uh, uh, that's, it's, it's also a beautiful. That is why Namakam and Chamakam are considered the ultimate Upanishad. If you understand every single mantra, what is the purpose? What do they remind us? And what do, how do we have to chant it? How do we have to practice it in our life? How do we have to contemplate? If you do it on a regular basis, uh, Swami says it will teach us, take us there. And the mantras just by chanting can infuse such change in us, make us understand it, uh, make us remember it, and make us live this life the way the Namakam and Chamaka Rishis who gave us as gift, they themselves traveled. Um, so I, with that, I will stop for today. It's 9.51 only. I'm very sorry. It's a short class. Um, but I thought, you know, if I start the 10th, you know, introduction itself will take time. So I thought I will reserve it for a fresh class. That's the only reason. I hope you all don't mind. Um, I will stop here. If there are questions, I will answer. Saira. Yes, Saira. Oh, sorry. Saira. Uh... Yes, the, the Shraddha, the for Shraddha translation, faith is accurate. No, it's not accurate, brother. Very good question. Uh, in English in English language, even the concept of Shraddha is not there. Shraddha is determined action with total faith. Unswerving, determined action without with complete faith, is Shraddha. Uh, okay. I don't know how to translate that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so I know that's the translation which is was in uh, Satisai speaks. So I just left it as is. Uh, your question is right, brother. Shraddha means you know we are not distracted by anything else. We are total focus, total focus. We are to totally determined. It is very firm. Our faith is firm that you know this will take us, and we. Do it very meticulously, rigorously, religiously. All that is Shraddha, is my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Sai Ramaruno, I think it is Chiradde Oda Yes, auntie. That Shraddha is nothing but Shraddha. Yes. Yeah, Chiradde Oda That should be I, if people who don't know English, we have to do it. But I think that is what is meant by that. Yes, auntie. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, I just thought of asking this again. We talked about this earlier also. Now, as as we are more into practice, uh, practicing chanting, this question keep coming. But no, no. But these uh, there are some explanations. But still, I found you know the, the importance of chanting with swara. Uh, it's uh, no. I, I don't know if, if you can. <laughs> I throw some more lights on it, light on it uh, so, uh, because uh, when when <coughs> chant the, the, the speed increase the, the swara uh, I don't know whether that uh, the, the, the the accuracy of swara uh, is uh, this thing. So uh, how how re really no no when we learn this thing, but uh, so what's uh, in Prashanti, they are, usually it's a moderate chanting, but uh, in in Jagnas, uh, uh, we find sometimes it's uh, it's uh, extremely fast. So sometimes, so that how you know, they say is is very important. So uh, how how does we uh, take it? <laughs> you know, if you can. Uh, gives uh, some more, uh, you can uh, shed some more light on it, it'll be useful. Eh? I think you know the answer, brother. You're asking a rhetorical question. But the thing is, swara is very important. 
because the intonation in our speech has a lot of impact. Um, for example, even when we call somebody or talk to somebody, the tone in which the modulation of voice, please come, that means, you know, your voice is going up or down, you know, accordingly, mm -hmm. it expresses mm -hmm. a certain emotion. So intonation is a very, imp like, for example, if somebody is acting a particular role in a drama or film, they'll be told that they should speak like this. Right. Even if, if you really feel, automatically the speech will come the way it should. When you're angry, we will speak in a certain way. When we are loving, we speak in a certain way. We call out, even if, when we call our children with a name, you know, the voice may go up and down or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. When we're anger, mm -hmm. we may raise the voice in a certain pitch. Mm -hmm. You know, all this happens naturally. So mm -hmm. this modulation of tones express mm -hmm. a certain bhava in us. So mm -hmm. until we develop the bhava, we have to artificially keep the tones. Mm -hmm. so the swara basically helps you create the bhava in you also. Okay. Okay. That is why the swaras are very, very important to create the appropriate bhava in us. Okay. So until we, that bhava develops in us, the swara has to be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. It goes up or down. So you you said people sometimes are rushing, you know, it's they're racing. Right. So the thing is, uh, un, see, certain people who have learned it well and mastered it can chant a little fast, no, no doubt. But right. it's like driving a car. When you're learning the car, it's better we do in 20 kilometer speed or 30 kilometer speed. And yeah. otherwise, we will not forget when to put signal, when to turn, when to brake when to look for the pedestrians, everything will be forgotten. Right. But once you master, a person can drive maybe at 60 or 100. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but if you go beyond 150, then you are not, no one in this world, human being can pay attention to anything. So that right. is, that comes in, can some sort of the category of over speeding. Right. Okay, so ideally, you can speed to the, necessary level of uh, mm -hmm. uh, pace, right. but it should never be overspeeding. But generally, because they want to get the count in a yeah. short impatience, right. See, it is not pacer, it's always impatience, right. which causes this kind of rushing. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Because yeah. there is zero bhava, that zero swara, yeah. because you are worried about the number. Yeah. Count. Mm -hmm. It's very sorry state of affairs, brother. That right. is why, you know, if if you, you know, if you chant too slowly also, people may fall asleep. Yeah. yeah. So the thing is, it has to be at the right tempo, tempo, you know, right. and without sacrificing bhava, right. uh, give it without uh, removing time from contemplating on the Lord. Right. I think each one of us have to understand that, uh, but you know, it will take a long time for people to come to that realization. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Sairam. Sairam. Yes, Sairam, Sister Devi. I think you have to unmute and speak, Sister Devi. Hey, Sairam, this is uh, something that maybe you've touched on before, I'm sorry, but this is um, the question on Rajabali. If, you know, he did everything to earn God's okay. grace, he was such a good saver. But why did with God, Vishnu Bhagwan, had to take, uh, see the importance of coming on earth to teach him a lesson? Was it, was he giving with ego? Because I know there was one thing that says that he was so excited, to, he recognized God as God and he wanted to give God. But then a thought came into his mind, my hand will be on top and God's hands will be below. And so there was a problem there. So is it because if somebody is doing so much seva do, to earn God grace, why did God have to come on earth to teach him a lesson? So, Tairam, sister. Um, Mahabali was a great devotee. He was a grandson of Prahlada. Prahlada's son was an atheist. But that, to, that, to that atheist was born Bali. So Bali was, even though he was a great 
a devotee, a great devotee, there was certain aspect of uh, ego which was there that, you know, which had to be removed to fully liberate him. Um, and for that, God comes through any form. You know, it can come through someone, an experience, a teacher, and so on. In this case, uh, Lord decided that he has to express. See, whenever the Lord came, he did not come for that person alone. He came to teach a principle for everyone also. So it's like the teacher taking the opportunity to educate everyone. They said, okay, this may be a good situation which I can demonstrate what the principle is for everyone to learn. So it was Bali himself was not the cause of Lord Vamana coming down. The Lord decided, okay, this is a good place where I can teach a lesson for the entire world as a principle for everyone to look after. So if you look at the entire history of uh, Puranas, no one is equal to Bali in demonstrating what is Atmani Vedana. So he's, then you can say Bali himself was the incarnation to demonstrate what is Atmani Vedana. Without divine grace, he couldn't have been born, he couldn't have lived, he couldn't have done that sacrifice. So the Lord always creates situations to teach Bali as well as us. If that did not happen, we will not understand Atmani Vedanam today. We will not be discussing it today. So the way I understand, but Bali may not be the only person which, for this whom it had happened. But that's a story which we all know. As Swami said, if you take one step towards me, I will take 10 steps towards you. We just read it. So you can see Bali was such a great devotee. The Lord walked and came, took many steps and came to him. And uh, that is the only way he himself was so pleased with him. He came and gave them. See, one of the things, you know, you asked why the Lord has to come. Actually, there's another discourse from Swami where he said, see, we go to many places, we see many sannyasis. In everywhere you go, usually the sannyasis are sitting in one place. If you go to the abode, they will sit in on a seat and everyone lines up to go and see them. Puttaparthi was the only place where the Lord came to the devotee. Swami says, I have to walk to the devotee and see them. They can sit, relax, but I will walk and go near them and see them. So the, the real God is always looking and running towards the devotee. He will not sit in one chair and everyone queue up and come and see him. That is the vatsalya of the Lord, like the mother coming, bending down and lifting up a child. So that was a great demonstration of Vamana. He came not to crush his ego because he saw him as a child whom he wanted to lift up. The body was pushed to the Patala, to the netherworld. But this Atman was merged in the Lord. Uh, so the Lord comes down always out of immense love. That he can't wait. The Lord is impatient that he has to come running. You take one step and he takes ten steps. So that's what I understand, sister. I hope, uh, I don't know whether I answered your question or not. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Thank you. I don't know, sister. Uh, there's some comment. Yes. The Lord always comes. If the devotee is in, devotion is so intense, the Lord can't wait. He comes running. Uh, so that's all I had to say. Uh, if there are no more questions, then we can close. It's a very early close for a session, I guess. But it's 10 or 4. Uh, we will meet again last next week uh, to continue with the 11th Anavaka of Chamaka. Sairam, everyone. We'll close with Samastaloka. Om Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Om
Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Sai Ramelu.